I want to welcome our Facebook family. I was waiting for them to give me the sign. Um, great to have you aboard with us tonight. We've got a whole house full of people just loving on each other right now um, and ready to get into God's Word. We've been going um, on our Wednesday nights through the Old Testament, uh, chapter by chapter, book by book and chapter by chapter. We are in the book of Deuteronomy um, right now, so I'll ask you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you, first and foremost, because you are so amazing. You, um, you, 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 you're just uh, all that we can talk about, all that we think about. And Lord, that's, that's all we want, is to be able to say that you are ours and we are yours. I pray that as we get into um, the study tonight, Lord, that we will recognize how important that is, our uh, surrender to you, our um, love for you. And Lord, that it would just really, um, we'd embrace it. And Lord, it would make us even that much more appreciative and loving of you. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody said, amen. and amen. Well, guys, at this stage um, in the book of Deuteronomy, the children of Israel were camped at the borders of the promised land. And it's been a long journey, 40 years. Everybody said out loud, what? 40 years they had been journeying. Um, and not because of them, but because of their, you know, stubborn parents, I, I want to say. Um, their stubborn parents didn't want to go in when God led them uh, the first time to the borders of the promised land. And so they wandered for 40 years. But now that faithless and defiant generation is finally gone. And this new generation is given their chance to obtain God's promised land. Everybody say their chance. So their parents had a chance, but they declined. They doubted God. They disobeyed God. And so for 38 and a half years, 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. And now this new generation is at the borders of that promised land. And it's now their chance to obtain it. Now, before they march in, Moses gathered all of them to give them final instructions. Say that out loud. What? Final instructions. And the final instructions, guys, are going to be a repeat. See, the book of Deuteronomy means otra vez. Everybody say it out loud. What? Otra or rerun. The book of Deuteronomy, that's what it is. Another law. Another, a rerun of the original. Okay? A copy, so to speak. So, at this point, what Moses is doing is he's gathering this new generation and he is going to give them their final instructions. He is going to go over what he had given their, their parents. Um, and the, this generation was young when the law was given to them. Uh, Forty years back in Exodus and Leviticus is, is when it was originally given. And now Moses is bringing this new generation and he's going to remind them of several things that they should never forget. Everybody said, Allah, they should what? Never forget. All right. So he brings them to this place all together. There's, you know, a, a million and a three quarter uh, uh, Israelites, and he brings them together and he says, listen, I'm going to give you final instructions. He says, in order to be God's people in the land that God is going to plant you in, in that land that's just right over the border over there, he said, mira, look, you see it? In order to be God's people in that land, he said, don't forget that everybody out loud, where God guides, he provides. He said this in Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. Here's what he said. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're trudging through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. Yeah, wow. Everybody say, wow. 40 years, they walked through the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Nothing. Because where God guides, everybody out loud, He provides. Now, we in the New Testament are also walking a journey with the Lord through a foreign territory, through a wilderness. Wouldn't you say this world can be kind of like a wilderness, huh? It has its challenges. It has its circumstances. And so we're, we're doing the same. Just like them, we're walking through a wilderness. 
And it would do us good to remember that God, our God, is faithful. And that where He guides, He provides. So whatever challenges you might be going through, whatever circumstances you might be going through, know this, that where God guides, He provides. He did for them, He will do it for us. Watch this, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. It's, you're familiar with it. Read it out loud with me. And my God will meet all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Is that some good news? And then how about Matthew chapter 6, verse 31? Jesus said, so don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and out loud together, and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. That's good news for all of us, right? Because just as He did for them that they lack nothing, the Lord will make sure as we're doing this journey that we lack nothing. So we should always remember, never forget, that where the Lord guides, He provides. The next thing Moses communicated, and we talked about it last week, was don't forget, don't forget, everybody out loud, who God directs, He protects. So don't forget that whoever God directs, He protects. And this was from Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 3. And it says, So the Lord our God also delivered into our hands Og, king of Bashan, with all of his people. And we attacked him until he had no survivors remaining. And we took all the cities at that time. There was not a city which he did not take from, that we did not take from them. Sixty cities. All the region of Argob and the kingdom of Og and Bashan. All these cities were fortified with high walls, gates and bars, besides a great many rule towers. And we utterly destroyed them as we did to Sihon, king of Heshbon. Meaning that there were a lot of difficulties. There were some giants. There were some enemies. In their way, but God, where God directs and who He directs, He also what? Protects. God is bigger than all of our problems. He's bigger than all of our fears. He is bigger than any mountain or giant that we can see or cannot see because nothing is impossible with our God. Say it out loud. Nothing is impossible with our God. And when we follow Him, here's what He does. He clears the path. He opened the Red Sea. He defeated enemies. He topples giants. He closes the mouths of lions. He moves mountains. He calms storms. He is a fierce defender who never slumbers nor sleeps. And He is on the job 24-7, 365 days a year. That's really good, guys. So where God guides, He provides. And whom God directs. And just think about this. The Lord said that for you, He's ordering your steps. You didn't find Jesus all of a sudden. You didn't stumble upon salvation. He directed you to that. He directs your path. And whoever He's directing, guess what He also does? He protects, right? Think about this. God promised this. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. That's some awesome protection. And then Psalm 138, verse 7. Though I walk, David said this, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand will save me. So whatever your giant is, whatever that 
circumstance is, whatever that enemy is. And we know one for one for sure, Satan, right? And it doesn't matter, he can huff and he can puff, but he will not blow your house down because the Lord is protecting you, right? The Lord's got you covered. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 32 says this. Read it out loud with me. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. He guards us. And then John chapter 10 and verse 28, we read it this past weekend. And it says, and I give them, this was Jesus, and he said, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. Nobody can take, nobody can take you down. Not without God's consent. <laughs> and He's never going to give the enemy consent. Can't take you out. Look at your neighbor and say, he, that Enemies can't take me out. So, Moses emphasized this so far. He said, don't forget that where God guides, He... And where God directs, He... And now He says, and don't forget... Moses is going to continue. He says, and don't forget... Everybody out loud, your purpose. Say it out loud. Your what? Your purpose. Let's read chapter 4, verse 5. Here's what it says. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, Moses is telling them, therefore be careful to observe them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all of these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon Him. And what great nation is there that has such statues and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? So he says, hey, listen, there's a couple of things I want, to, I want you not to forget. First, where God guides, He provides. Where God directs, He will protect. And here's the next one. And he says, and listen, don't forget your purpose. Their purpose wasn't to be the best. Their purpose wasn't to be the most popular or the wealthiest or the smartest or the greatest. Their purpose was to, as we read there, to share and to shine. Say it out loud. To what? To share and to shine. To just allow God in their lives to the point that it would change their lives so much that they would reflect that. God's blessing would be upon them. God's hand would be upon them. And people would see it and identify it and recognize what is so different about it. How is it that these people have God so close to them? Do you get it? That was their purpose. The Lord wants us here in the New Testament to shine also, just like them, to be a witness of His love, of His grace and His faithfulness. To point the world to Him. Yes, the Lord saved us so we could belong to Him. And so we could be with Him. But He also saved us so we could become like Him. Did you guys get catch that? He wants us to reflect His mercy, His grace, and His transformation power. He told them, hey, listen, when you get in the land, keeping my laws and living by my, by my code, he said, it's going to create such blessing in your life. And it's going to, it's going to shine. And, you, and with that, when people ask you, how, how is it that you, you know, God, you, you're so blessed. How is it that, you know, you go through difficulties and yet the Lord protects you. The Lord provides for you. How is it? Well, yes, because it is the Lord. You're pointing to him. He says, and that, that's our purpose, to share and to shine. He saved us because He wants us to belong to Him. He wants us to be with Him. But He also saved us so that we could become like Him. So that we could reflect everything about God. See, you and I should be the evidence of His love, of His forgiveness, and His miraculous power. 
I'm going to let that kind of set for a little bit. And if you didn't hear me, I'm going to say it again. So if you didn't, listen up, listen up. Nudge your neighbor, say listen up. You and I should serve as evidence of God's love, of God's forgiveness, and God's miraculous power. Jesus commissioned us like this in John chapter 13, verse 34. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By, read this part out loud, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. All right, so the first, he said, hey, listen, I want you to reflect my love out there where you live, out there where you work, out there in your life. I want you to reflect my love because, guys, what it'll do is it speaks volumes for God. You know, because there's nothing, it, what you don't want is, is, is kind of like, you know, that I, I, I've told you about that loan officer who he told the guy who was applying for the loan, he said, I tell you what, forget this, this application. If you can tell me which one is a glass, my glass eye, I'll let you have the loan. And the man looked at him real close, and he said, I think it's this one. And he said, why do you say that? And he said, I think I saw a little bit of mercy in there. <laughs> That's not the kind of Christian we want to be, where they have to really get down and look Hard to see God in there. We, it ought to be oozing out of our life. Love and forgiveness and mercy and grace. It should be oozing out of us. Jesus said, that's how they'll know you're my disciples. Not because, you know, for any other reason, you love. That love is just oozing out. In fact, the Bible says that when we become born again, the Holy Spirit, in the book of Romans, says that the Holy Spirit sheds the love of God in our heart. We begin to soften up. And it's the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the working of God in our lives. So he says, and that, that's, that, that's, that's our purpose, to reveal that. The Apostle Paul echoed Jesus' statement in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. Here's what he said. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. So right there, Look at your neighbor and say, attitude adjustment. Look, look at your neighbor and say, that's what he just said. He said, because this is our purpose. Our purpose isn't to complain. Right? Our purpose isn't to complain or be combative or to be argumentative. No, no. He says, hey, listen. He says, don't do that. Look at your neighbor and say, don't do that. Don't do that. No complaining. No arguing. No. Ooh, forget it. None of that. Stop that. God said, you ought to have your glass half full. Huh? It, should, it ought to be half full. So don't complain. Don't argue. He says, because other people will criticize you. What he wants you to do is lead clean, innocent lives, shining like bright lights in a wonderful, excuse me, in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Shine. Look at your neighbor and tell him, shine. Shine. All right? After the resurrection, Jesus commissioned us like this. Is it that it's our, our purpose. This is what our purpose is, to shine and to share. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news. Then he added this, and make disciples. Everybody said out loud what? Make disciples. So they were told then. The same thing we've been told. Or I should say, we've been told the same thing they were told. The idea was, hey, listen, don't forget your purpose. Because as we forget our purpose, sometimes we start thinking life is all about us. About what we want and what I, what I need and what I want to hear. And what I, you know, God, 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 you know, what about me? Uh -huh. no, 
your purpose is. God says, don't forget your purpose. Your purpose is to share and shine all about the Lord. He said, and make disciples. Moses also told his people, don't let your purpose die with you. Teach and instruct your children. Or in other words, pass it on. So, you know, shine and share. Everybody say it out loud again. What? Shine and share. Here's what he, what he said. Chapter 4, verse 9. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself. Lest you forget these things your eyes have seen and lest, you, uh, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and to your grandchildren especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, which the Lord said to me, gather the people to me and I will let them hear my words and that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. All right, so he says, he says, I don't want you to forget so far three things. He said, where God guides, he provides. Where God directs, he protects. And don't forget your purpose. And then he said, and don't forget, in forgetting your purpose, don't forget your purpose. Make sure that you pass it on, that you shine and you share. Share it with everybody. Moses commanded the Israelites to pass their faith on. And he emphasized the covenant, or the place where they received the covenant. They're at Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb, same place. So he tells them, he says, and remember what happened there. He said, and, and teach it to your, to, to your, to your family. Don't ever forget that event where God came down and, and he, he made himself available and he gave us a covenant. He said, don't forget that. Now, stop and think about us. We New Testament Christians have also been told to teach and emphasize the place where God met us. It was also a mount on Mount Calvary. Right? Jesus instituted the communion table so we wouldn't forget. He Remember, he said this, do this in remembrance of me. And what, does it, what, what do those, the, the, the two elements uh, remind us of? The broken bread, Jesus said, like my broken body, which will be broken for you. And the cup of juice, it, it will be like, it's, symbolism is in my blood of the new covenant. The new covenant in my blood will, that will be shed for you. So just like Moses, he said, guys, 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 you were young. Some of you were so young. And some of you didn't even, you, you, you weren't even there because you got born in this 40 years, period. He said, there at Mount Horeb, God met us. And he gave us a covenant. And he made us his people. Don't forget that. He says, and make sure you teach that to all the oncoming generations make sure that you pass that on that you share and shine that so here's what he told us member look at your neighbor and say member member what the covenant god made with us on a mountain two thousand years ago where god came down and he gave himself as a sacrifice his body was broken and his blood was shed and it's something that we're told that we should never forget that we should always remember. Because it was the covenant where Jesus made it available, made relationship with God available to us. And we need to pass that on. And that's why it's important for us as a church. When we have communion, we do it once a month. In the, old, in the New Testament, when they, right after Jesus' resurrection, and as the church began to grow, they had they had. Communion every time they got together. They remember to remember. It's important. That's the, that's the place of our covenant. I know some people want to erase a bloody cross and a bloody Christ. And you know, that, that's, that's dress up Christianity. But, but guys, that is where the covenant took place. That's where our salvation was made. That's where Jesus said, it is is finished. Yeah. Guys, and that's why I said, and focus on that. Remember that. For us, guys, if we lose sight of what it cost Jesus to save us, we'll become a bunch of entitled brats. 
that have no regard for sacrifice or commitment or surrender or service. You know, you have you talked you 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 you've talked about some of that X Y Z generation, right? That are so entitled. Like the one young man whose father-in-law, he just got he just married his daughter, and, and the father-in-law had a business, and he offered him 50% of his company. And he told the young man, all you have to do is, is to oversee the production at the plant. And the, the, the kid said, I don't like plants. I don't like to work there. I don't like to work at big buildings like that. I don't like to get my hands dirty. So then the father said, well, then work in the office and oversee operations. Giving you 50% of the company, he said, nah, I don't really like to work in offices. I don't like office work. I, I just, I don't like to be restricted. Well, the father said, well, then what should I do with you? The kid said, well, buy me out of my 50%. <laughs> now, that's not what God intended for us, right? He don't want us to be like that. We were to remember what Jesus did constantly so we recognize the sacrifice, the surrender, the service, the love that he gave, that he became that sacrifice. And we need to remember that, hey, listen, we need to be like him. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says it like this, He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Wow. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you guys catching that? We're to always remember that sacrifice. We're to always pass that on. But remembering it especially because, hey, listen, we've got to die to ourselves. Look at your neighbor and say, you've got to die to yourself. Tell them, you selfish brat. Ha! Oh, what do you mean? What? Hey, listen, we've got to die to ourselves. First John chapter 2, verse 6 says it like this. Read it out loud with me. Those who say they live in God should live their lives. How did Jesus live? Forgiving the unthinkable. Enduring the intolerable. Loving unconditionally. And serving enthusiastically. Don't be an entitled brat. Get into service. Show your love, your appreciation, and your affection that you are becoming like Jesus. Selfish Christian, catch this, selfish Christian is an oxymoron. What does that mean? Two words that shouldn't be put together. Two words that are confusing. So selfish Christian, huh, it, that's confusing. It's like jumbo shrimp. Crash landing, original copy, exact estimate, civil war, good grief, selfish Christian. Our love for Jesus and our faith in Jesus should be seen by our works of service. James chapter 2 verse 26 says it like this, faith without works is dead. Say it out loud. Faith without works is dead. No faith. Hey, guys, no faith at all. No love at all. Hey, listen, if there's, no, if, there, if there's no works, there's no faith at all. If there's no works, there's no love at all. Remember when was one of the, one of the times where Jesus was anointed with oil and 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 his feet washed with, with tears and, and and the lady's hair and remember one of the sideliners you know stood up and said you know I, how how dare this woman touch him and he he said hey listen he who loves who he who has been forgiven much loves much 
That, uh, that should be. And, and, and then John said it this way. He, he, he said, um, we love him because he first loved us. So, let's continue. Don't forget what your God is capable of. In other words, don't forget that where God guides, He provides. Where God directs, He protects. Don't forget the, and don't forget your purpose, that you should shine and share. And then Moses goes on and says, don't forget the commandments. The Word of God. Everybody say it. The what? The what? The Word of God. Don't forget the Word of God. God has given us a code to live by. It's called the Ten Commandments. And, and in chapter 5, um, it is, it, Moses reviewed them. He, you know, he reviewed all of them. He went over every single one and made sure that they remembered. But he summed them up in chapter 6. See, Moses knew that 10 is too many for our shallow brain. Hmm? I'll prove it to you. Is there anyone here that can quote all 10? Huh? Okay, one person? All right, so, so think about it. All ten commandments. What's the first commandment? What's the seventh commandment? Seven. Nine. Which is nine? Here, here we go, here we go. You see what I'm saying? So, so, so it should, you should probably say, Moses, thank you. And really, God, thank you. Because here's what he does. He says, I'm going to go ahead and sum them all up into one commandment. Here he goes. Here's a summation of what he wants. Chapter 6, verse 4. Here's what he said. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk in the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as a, the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So he summed it all up into one. He, he reviewed all, all ten of them in chapter 5, but then in chapter 6, he says, I'm going to give you the summation. He says, loving God with every fiber in your being. That's the command. Loving God with every fiber in your being. He's on your mind when you wake up and when you go to bed. He's the one we aim to please during the day. We do our work as unto Him. He's the praise on our lips. His word is in our hearts, and he is seen in our attitude, in our actions, in our aspirations. That's loving God with all your mind, your soul, your strength, and your heart. So I'll close with a promise from Psalm, Psalm 119, verse 2. Read it out loud with me. Blessed are those who keep God's statutes and seek God with all their heart. How do we seek God with all our heart? Well, just like we said, he's, we make him the first thought of our morning, the last thought of our day. And throughout our day, we're sure to do our work and our life unto Him. Every bit of it. Moses was bringing this. Listen, this is how you will be successful at being God's children in the place that He's planted you. Don't forget that where God guides, He provides. And don't forget that where God directs, He protects. He's an awesome God. And don't forget your purpose. I know sometimes we think our career is our purpose, but it's not. Living our life for God, shining and sharing, and reflecting who He is. He saved you for just that reason.
Because the people in your sphere of influence need the light in their life. And he saved you. He said, so, so do that. And then here's the next thing. And always remember, don't forget to keep track of his word. And what, is, what does his word tell us? To live by, that code to live by. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now, there's something interesting that here in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, Moses, I, I don't think he left it out because he's repeating, right? He's repeating what's been said. Levitic, this passage of Scripture is in Leviticus chapter 9 where Jesus, or excuse me, where Moses had told him, where God told him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So you say, well, but it's not here. It's not here. Well, Jesus came around a little later on, and they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? And you know what he said? It's Mark chapter 12. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. By doing this, you will have fulfilled all of the Ten Commandments. Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. But the Lord blesses whoever will keep his word, who will be obedient to his word, and who will seek him with their whole heart. And I know that's all of you. That's why we're here. We want to know more, how to better serve him, how to better please him. And so we make attitude adjustments, right? When we're here at church, oh, right? We hate it, but oh, I got to make that attitude adjustment. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for these instructions that were given in the Old Testament and have so much relevance for us today. I pray, Father, that we would learn the lessons that we need to learn, and make the adjustments that we need to make, especially when it comes to our purpose here on earth. The time is short. We're at the very brink of the end of days. And if there's any been ever been a time that we need to be a reflection of you it's in this dark world today so i pray father that you would help us you would help us not just to belong but to become just like you that it would be seen in our daily activities at home in our marriages with our family that it would be seen lord and as we're working to you we're serving you here at church. But that love that we have for you, that gratitude, that appreciation, Lord, that it would be seen in our everyday lives. And that it, it would be honored. It would, it would be an honor to you, but more than that, a reflection to all of the people in this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Let's all stand. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to smile on you and be gracious to you and give you peace. May the beauty of the Lord be upon you and may he establish all the works of your hands. Guys, I was preaching in the choir tonight. I know how much you love God. Let's sing one last song to him before we go.